It's time for the parent memoirs. So a new justice is assigned to the case, and his name is Richard G. In some of the the videos I watched, they pronounced it Gee because it's spelled G E E, but in the Australian like documentary, they pronounce it G. So Justice G. Okay. All right. Okay. He's intolerant as fuck when it comes to Leonard. Good. He was, he went to seminary at first. Like he was, he was a deeply religious person. Didn't suffer fools. He was dedicated. He was actually a lay minister in his church. He had a wife, Helen, and a little boy, Stephen, and a little girl, Allison. Now he was appointed to the court the day after Opus was murdered. And his lifelong goal was to be a judge, but he was, kind of he was kind of hesitant at first because he felt like that was a really crummy way of becoming a judge like really yeah that's that's sad but he eventually took the role now there's a gap here where nothing happens for a couple years it's about four years okay okay so all that happened in 1980 in 1981 justice g rules that the home that both Leonard and Andrea had purchased needed to be sold. Okay. I don't quite understand why he wouldn't let Leonard just buy her out of the house. Like, he could have given her the money, like, um, maybe for her half of the house. Maybe the judge didn't feel like he would abide to it. Maybe. I don't know. Like, maybe yeah, he would just be a prick and be like, fuck you, no. <laughs> that's a good point, because honestly... Trust with I their mean, experience with him, right? Erring on on the side of him being potentially a prick is highly <laughs> <Potentially>. likely, mm-hmm. <laughs> highly plausible at yes. that point. So he says the house needs to be sold. The proceeds split. This beyond upset Leonard. This was his castle. This was this was his domain. No judge was going to tell him he couldn't live there. Like, good lord. So for four years, it's pretty much quiet. Leonard continues to be difficult and he still will not. He keeps delaying the sale of the house. Of course. When they send people to try to do like an evaluation on it, he kicks them off the property, won't let them in. He's still continuing to do the shit with Trudy where he's just taking her and not giving her back or taking her from school and just just being a fucking shit. Like, yeah, Lord. So in between that point, there is a coroner's inquest into Justice Opus and Stephen Blanchard's death, where Kristen actually comes, Judge Opus's widow, she comes to court. She didn't know that there was a suspect. She didn't know the name Leonard Warwick until she showed up at court that day. And she found him to be terrifying. Like, yeah, just his his mere presence. Right. But the coroner's inquest doesn't really go anywhere. Okay. Now, throughout 1983 and 1984, Leonard avoids getting served um, with papers that Justice G had issued, basically evicting him from the house, right? He's refusing to answer the door. At one point, they show up at his job, and he locks himself in the bathroom like a teenage girl, refusing to come out. Like He's leading them on these like wild chases. Like It's, it's ridiculous. When he would show up to court, he would not have a lawyer, he would be unprepared, and, I mean, it was just a mess. And Justice G was just getting more and more pissed off. Yeah. So, at one point, Leonard kept Trudy for too long, Andrea alerted him, and Justice G had enough, and he sent federal and state police with a warrant to basically storm the house, get her, and bring her back to her mother. As you can imagine, Leonard was upset. <laughs> right. And God. the next court date was set for March 6th. On March 6th, um, it's about 1.30 in the morning. And Justice G was home asleep. His wife had some sort of serious heart issue going on. And she was currently in the hospital. Okay. Thank Christ. She was in the hospital. Yeah. His two children, Allison and Stephen, were in the home asleep. And at 1.30 in the morning, a bomb goes off and destroys their house to the point where they said that, and I even saw pictures of it, you, you would just think you were looking at just a pile of rubble. You wouldn't 
even be able to tell it was a house. Like it was That's bad. Crazy. Yeah. And a giant, like one of those giant, like timber support beams had mm-hmm. landed on Justice G's bed right where Helen, his wife, usually slept. It would have crushed and killed her instantly, more than likely. But she yeah. was in the hospital. Thank God. And looking at the house at right? first. Thank God is right. Exactly. Looking at the house at first, they thought there's no way anybody survived. But miraculously, Justice G was seriously injured. His legs were shredded to hell. His children were cut. There were some serious injuries, but they were going to be okay. And it was just an absolute miracle that they yeah. were okay. Now, their next court date was for March 6th, and that bombing happened at 1.30 a.m. on March 6th, All right? So police go question Justice G. Who do you think could have done this? Justice G's like, Leonard. It's fucking Leonard. Once again. Right? It's fucking yeah. Leonard. Ugh. Once again, <laughs> they do a search. They don't find anything. He has no alibi, and he won't talk. Oh, God. Great. <laughs> yeah i know like i said this is exhausting and we're not even like we're only halfway through okay so on april 14th <laughs> i know right on, on april 14th a bomb goes off at 10 20 p.m at the family court building in okay paramedda paramata i don't mm-hmm. know if i'm saying that right now miraculously they think that the bomb was supposed to go off at 10 20 a.m but it went off at 10, 20 when people PM. were there. Exactly. Yeah. So he was totally gotcha. willing to kill children. Like, yep. didn't matter. Like, whatever. Now, a janitor was, was a, they called it, him a caretaker, which I think is the way that they refer to, like, janitorial workers. Um, yeah. Had just left, like, almost, like, 30 seconds before that bomb went off. Like, they yeah. got lucky as hell. Yeah. So... A new justice is assigned to their case, Andrea and Leonard's case. His name is Justice yes. Ray Watson. Yes. Now, Justice Watson had been married once before. I can't remember if he was divorced or if she passed, but he ended up remarrying this lovely woman named Pearl. Pearl worked in the counseling office um, of the family court, and he was a justice. Um, they had a nice little blended family. His children, his children basically describe Pearl as having loved them back to life. Like after like they, their family had, I'm pretty sure his first wife passed. Um, Gotcha. And they, but they just adored Pearl. She was an amazing, amazing woman by all accounts. Justice Watson had restricted Leonard's visitation because once again, he's being a shit. And on the morning of July 4th, uh, 1984, Pearl and um, Ray, Justice Watson, were getting ready to leave for work. There were some conflicting stories about why she was the one who opened the door first, because they worked at the same building. Mm -hmm. One person thought that she would always open the door first because of what happened to Justice Opus, that, you know, he opened the door and somebody shot him. Right. Their theory was that she would always open the door first because if somebody was there, she could shut it and they wouldn't get to shoot her husband, basically. Another okay. person said that this was just part of a cute little ritual that they had where she would open the door, he would go to go out, kiss her on the cheek, like, have a good day, dear. And then he would keep walking and then she would shut the door behind she her. And yeah, they would like, go. Yeah. Okay. Well, there was, she went to open the door. She opened it just a few centimeters. And there was a bunch of, of sticks of, of explosives in a bag that was set on their door, doorstep. There was a string attached to the zipper. And when you opened the door, because the string was attached to the door, it unzipped the bag, set off the detonator, and a bomb went off. Justice Watson survived. He was injured, but he survived. Unfortunately, Pearl was literally like her from like her calves down were still in front of the door. But the rest of her body was blown through a brick wall that literally had like an imprint of her body. Like, yeah, just 
was awful. That's sad. It was awful. Her her stepdaughter especially was just devastated. She was like, anybody but Pearl. Please tell me it wasn't Pearl. Like, right. it just isn't fair. Yeah. yeah. And Justice Watson is like, it's fucking Leonard. <laughs> like, don't really know what to tell you. It's fucking Leonard. Now, right. at this point, Andrea had a new legal counsel. His name was Gary Watts. Okay. Gary Watts had advised her. He knew the history, and he had advised her to get a little bit more tough with Leonard. Like, this is bullshit what he's doing. Right. So one day he shows up at the house, unannounced, not on visiting day, and tried to take Trudy. And she said to him, my new counselor, Gary Watts, says that blah, 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 blah. Right? He actually punches her and tries to take Trudy. She manages to snatch her back, gets in the house, locks the door. Leonard leaves, you know, screaming and cursing as he's driving away. She calls her sister Judy and is like, we got to get the fuck out. Like, he's going to kill me. Like, yeah. it's going to happen. So she starts making arrangements to leave. But now Leonard knows her new lawyer's name. Right. I'll give you three guesses as to who was next on his hit list. The new lawyer. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I, you yep. know, I'm kind of surprised that at some point the lawyers weren't like, oh, sorry, ma'am, I can't represent you. <laughs> oh, no, no, they were. Oh, were they? They were. It was it was hard to find Gary. And I didn't quite understand this because I read one article that said Gary was also a judge at the court. So I guess he was like a judge and a lawyer at this, like doing both. And I think that he agreed to represent her simply because... She didn't really have any other options. People wouldn't, like, they knew he was a suspect and he was right. getting away with it. And right, it was hard as hell to find anybody to help her. I just. Yeah. Oh, God. So Gary had recently sold his house. And whoever had purchased his house was renting it out to three siblings, one of whom's name was Peter. And okay. on the morning of... um actually don't know the actual date on this one. It was in 1985. Peter goes out to his car because he's got to take it in to get it registered. So he was like changing out a filter or whatever. And he lifts up the, the hood of his car. They call it the bonnet of the car. Mm -hmm. He lifts up the hood and lo and behold, there's a bomb attached to his engine. And he's like, holy fuck. Calls the police. But the police are at first confused because they know there have been all these bombings that are connected to the family court. But this dude isn't connected to the family court at all. So at first they're like, what the fuck? Right. What the hell? What's going on? But they quickly put it together that the phone book still has Gary Watts listed as this being his address. And it's like, oh, shit. This was meant for Gary. Like, yeah. fuck. So Gary quits. He's just like, fuck this. And Andrea is just like, okay, we got to get out. That's, that's it. Right. Now her sister, after Stephen had passed, the little brother Stephen, she had found comfort in a new church. She had become a Jehovah's Witness, right? Mm -hmm. And okay. she found it to be very comforting and soothing like and andrea went with her to a few meetings so did trudy leonard did not like this he was like you keep my daughter away from those jehovah people like he just right. didn't like them but judy reaches out to the church and asks for help to get and because one of the things that gary had told andrea was get out of sydney and don't even tell me where you're going like right so Judy reaches out to the church and the church members trying to be helpful. One of them takes over the, the house that they're renting and the rest of them move her like out of Sydney quick. Like it's like a day and they end up going up to a place called Forrester, which is, I Googled it. It's 99 kilometers North of Sydney. Okay. Um, now Leonard shows up to try to, take Trudy again and he finds out that they're gone and he flips the fuck out right and he immediately suspects the Jehovah's Witness uh community because he knows Judy's a member because he's thinking she needed help to move this quickly like sh and she isn't 
you know, have a ton of friends and know a whole bunch of people. So that was like a logical conclusion for him. Right. So he starts like stalking the Jehovah's Witness members, calling them, harassing them. And they don't really tell him anything, or at least most of them don't. One person says, oh, I think they went up north. That's all they said. But this tipped him off that like, oh, they did, they did help. They're hiding my wife and my daughter from me. Like, and he's just getting more and more and more fucking agitated. So one day the Jehovah's Witness, um, uh, like the, the people who work at the, at the Kingdom Hall where this happened, this was at the, what was it called? The Kasula Kingdom Hall. They show up and somebody had broken in to the church. They had broken a window, but nothing was stolen. Nothing was really vandalized or disturbed. Whoever had done it had cut themselves and there was a, a ton of blood, apparently. So they called the police. The police dismiss it as local homeless people just looking for a place to like sleep. And they take a sample of the blood, but this is 1985. We didn't have DNA testing at this point. Like, right. So they take a sample of the blood, but they don't really do anything. Nothing was taken. Yeah. And the only thing messed up was a window. And they're like, okay. So about a week later, somebody breaks into that very same window once again. Nothing's really done because nothing's disturbed. Apparently the thought process most likely of Leonard is, you know, I can find maybe some paperwork or something that might show where they went. Right. Right. But after that, the I believe it was the same morning after the second break in was, was reported in the middle of church, the middle of a service. With a hundred plus people in it, a bomb goes off in the church. Of course. With children and... Jesus. It killed the minister of the church. His name was Graham uh, Wicks. Um, But I know it doesn't sound this way, but the, the building was destroyed, but he was the only fatality. And they got damn lucky because the the physics of a bomb in particular one of the dangers of a bomb is when it displaces that the the enter the air it creates a mm-hmm. vacuum and things can right. suck back in and buildings can basically collapse in and crush everybody right. but for some reason this bomb made the building explode out rather than okay. in so there was a ton of injuries but only one fatality Okay. Everybody's fucking horrified, of course. Right. Judy, Judy feels insanely guilty. She feels like, of course, you know, she brought this on. Andrea feels incredibly guilty. Like, yeah, because they're not sociopaths. Like, even though it's not right. their fault, they they feel like it is. Well, yeah, because she's bringing all these people into, you know, not not that she's bringing them into it, but, you know, mm-hmm. it's because of her situation that she has to have all these people involved. Right. And the people who were renting the house that Andrea had, had been renting, they actually mm-hmm. pull the cops aside at the scene and they tell them, like, we think we know who did this. It was this dude and he showed up at the house and, like, was harassing us to find out where they went. And the cops immediately are like, you need to get the fuck out of that house. And right, like, yeah. And they were like, why? And they were like, because we think he's the family court bomber. You need to get the fuck out. Like, yeah. oh, shit. Now, the police also go question Andrea and Judy. Who could have done this? You guys. It's fucking Leonard. <laughs> like, it's fucking <laughs> Leonard. Like, this is the point in Bailey Sarian's video where she freaks the fuck out. And I understand it. Like, at this point, it's like, who do you think it is? It's fucking Leonard. <laughs> oh my God. Right? Damn it. Man, it's infuriating. It is. But once again, the laws, there's no proof of anything. They go to... Now, at this point, though... You're going to think this is funny. At this point, they okay. go to question <laughs> Leonard again and again yep. they find no proof he maintains his right to silence blah 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 but he did blah, have blah blah blah, blah. <laughs> he did have a new quote-unquote girlfriend she still maintains that they weren't in a relationship but they seem to be who fucking knows but <laughs> this is the part that's gonna make you laugh she was a bit she was a blabbermouth and she was telling him shit 
Like, yeah, Leonard's been looking for Trudy and Judy and he's getting, and Andrea, and he's getting pissed off and blah, blah, blah. He eventually shuts her up. But she has a hatred for the cops, right? And she is described as, quote, by the cops, a low-class girl with tattoos and a rough manner. (laughs) Oh, man. (laughs) Well, you know, us girls are like that. See, there you go. And Bailey Sarian's video, she's covered in tattoos. And she kind of like, after she says that, she's, they, she zooms the camera in on her own face. And then she's like, this feels like a personal attack. <laughs> <I'm> like, <laughs> right? And I read it and I thought about telling the story to you. And I was like, Jessica's going to think that's funny. She's a rather yep. low class girl with tattoos and a rough manner. It's like, ooh. I just thought about, I can't remember the supervisor that called you spirited. Like, Jessica's very spirited. I can't remember that. Who was that? I don't remember. I don't know. But yeah. Carly would probably know. (laughs) Yeah, that's true. So her her name is Lorraine, and they still to this day kind of believe that Lorraine held the key, like, because a woman had been calling around to church members as well as as Leonard. Um, They did find a list in Leonard's house of church members um, names and phone numbers but that was about it when the press and the media and everybody were finally like alerted that this or I don't know if they were alerted or uh, they kind of figured it out after a while that all of these things Mm -hmm. were were connected the family because for a long time nobody wanted to believe like that this was somebody who was targeting the court Mm -hmm. it it was too uncomfortable. They wanted to believe that Kristen was responsible for, you know, David's shooting because it made them feel better that they weren't in danger. But after it started to to become this pattern that couldn't be ignored and the public knew about it, et cetera, et cetera. Believe it or not, if you remember, we talked about those men's advocacy groups. Um, yeah. They regarded this bomber as a hero. That's yeah, nice because stuff. it was it, at a certain point you, you realized like, oh, they are targeting the court specifically, the judges. And the, the other thing that fed that, unfortunately, was when the law was passed in 1976, you had a ton of like conservatives and, and church leaders who felt that this was, you know, immoral and awful and blah, blah, blah. And they were out there saying that, well, I mean what did you expect? This was bound to happen. And it was like, (laughs) why was it bound to happen? Mm -hmm. Like, no, it wasn't. It wasn't bound to happen. Okay. You're assholes. Sorry. Like the world is changing. Like, (laughs) I don't know what it, the thought that, yeah, I, mm, no. So you (laughs) had these, these men calling him a folk hero and you had these religious leaders and conservatives saying that you know not justifying it but saying i don't want to say that they were saying it was justified but they kind of were like yeah yeah right um and because of this because of this public reaction right that they you know a lot of people were sympathetic with the court but you did have a good chunk of people that weren't and you had, and the fear was copycats, right? Because yeah. if you think about yeah. it, like there was that sniper from DC years and years and years ago that was killing like random people just for no reason. Mm-hmm. And it turned out once they caught him yep. that his plan was to actually kill his ex wife and make it look like she was just part of this random sniper. Like that she was, it was all to cover up the premeditated murder of his wife, of his ex-wife. They were kind of concerned that other bombers would start to do this shit, right? Because they were like, oh, I can judge, you know, my, my judge too. I can blow him up. So they kept a lot of details back from the press on the specifics of the bomb. So that the bombs, so they could like weed out copycats but it was absolutely yeah, a fear that makes sense. but because of that and the press reaction and the public reaction people at, who worked at the family court just started to quit 
or they just wouldn't show up or they would just work from home or I mean they were terrified because nobody like they're like am I going to be even if I'm not involved even after Leonard was publicly identified like even if I'm not involved Mm -hmm. in Leonard's case what if somebody else gets this idea and it's me next like they were afraid that he was emboldening other men or people to do this and it was like I mean honestly understandable yeah that's a good fear I mean it makes sense unfortunately and especially when like especially with uh Justice Watson with Pearl his Mm -hmm. wife died not him like right that was messed up mm. and and to be fair they did have other suspects that they chased down there were some pretty outlandish like because Len Warwick was not out there like tooting his horn before this and telling anybody that would listen Mm -hmm. like not in the way that some men did like this one dude he was like making pamphlets and shit and like passing them out to other people like about how how awful the family court was and just this absolute vendetta against it but i mean everybody they looked at they just they looked and they looked at quite a few. The book goes into details on each of them. Like, they were just like, nope, he's got alibis or whatever. Eventually, they figure out the only connection to all of these people is Len Warwick. Is Leonard, is fucking right. Leonard. Fucking, fucking Leonard. Leonard. <laughs> and they were, they said, like, <laughs> it is statistically that. It's not Leonard, and he. It, this was just a coincidence that he's the only connection to all these people. Was like one in like yeah. I think he said like eight hundred million or something stupid like that, and it was like, okay, pretty sure. That's crazy. It's fucking Leonard, right? It's fucking fucking Leonard. Leonard. Um, they Leonard does an interview, um, when he's named publicly as a suspect. That's Mm kind of terrifying. Like, you can tell, like, he's very controlled. But at one point, like, he gets this smile on his face that you could tell he's, like, thrilled he's getting away with it. He's beyond thrilled. One of the creepy things about the interview that he did, and they have the transcripts in the books of, like, his interviews where he's, like, just refusing to answer any questions. Like... And it's exhausting yeah. to read through it. I there were many times I had to just keep skipping past because it was just constant. Yeah, like I maintain my right to silence. I maintain my right to silence. I maintain my right to silence. Like oh my god, but in the interview with the with the TV station, they asked him. They were like, "Would you be willing to take a polygraph, like with us as like the news?" Yeah, and he was like, "Why?" And they were like, "Uh," and then he said, "It's my understanding it's not admissible in court." Right. And they were like, um, well, we don't know. We would have to look into that. Like he was asking, like, if you give me a polygraph, can you turn around and give it to the police as if they had given it to me? Right. Right. Yeah. And they were like, we don't know. And he's like, well, if it's not admissible, what's the point? No. And you could just in the this kind of like round and round about this polygraph for a minute just really gave you that glimpse because he was very controlled throughout the whole interview. But that was the point where you really saw that, that difficult Leonard, like poke his head out. Yeah. Right. "Mm -hmm." And at this point, Andrea is living with her mother, Marjorie again. Fuck this narcissistic bitch. She doesn't, she doesn't like kids, and she's now got this, t- you know, five, six-year-old, seven-year-old, however old. Tr- I think Trudy was like six or seven at this time, running around. She's, you know, a loud kid, and Marjorie doesn't like it. So Marjorie is like harassing Andrea, believe it or not, telling her, "Just give him the child. This will stop if you just give- seriously." Yeah. Mm-hmm. And everybody just wears Andrea down, and she gives Trudy to Leonard and like I said I will not tolerate one comment from anybody about how all these people are dying around her right 
Yeah. Like, number one. And number two, she was afraid that Leonard was going to kill her and maybe even end up killing Trudy just to ke- just to keep Andrea from having her. Like, she was terrified. And you could tell it was just an agonizing decision. Well, yeah. And she felt like if he's if he's doing all this stuff to get her, maybe he will protect her maybe because he's so adamant about this like i mean it was kind of a gamble but honestly she just she couldn't handle the guilt anymore she really just couldn't yeah he broke her down yeah that's i mean that's bound to happen at some point unfortunately and and think about it like you not only are you afraid he's gonna kill you you're afraid he's gonna kill you and get away with it well yeah because he's getting away with everything else so what is his relationship like with Trudy? I mean, does, I mean, is he good with her or, okay. Well, according to her, <laughs> according to her, she would like during her childhood, like he was a good father. He loved her, but he was very possessive and very, you know, strict. And in her early childhood, like that seemed to be okay, but we'll get to a little bit later. But there were things that were like okay he would hide her in a cl- at the like bottom of a closet right okay when anybody came to try to get her like uh-huh. when he kept her for too long yeah he would make her hide and sometimes they would be there for like a while and he would make her hide in a closet and she remembers that when people would call he would like have her pick up the phone so he didn't have to like talk to them and she was like, you know, three or four. Uh, and it was like, she's just picking up the phone and playing with it. Like, right. Yeah. Like, okay. Yeah. He just, he used her as, you know, we used to see it when I would listen to collections calls. People would have their mm-hmm. kids pick up the phone. Right. And like, take a message. Yeah. Like, all right. Yeah. Um, now, Andrea gives over Trudy. She still has visitation. But the attacks stop completely. What a coinky dink. The investigation continues, but the thing that the... And at a certain point, they do... The police do bring all of this information to, like, what seems like the equivalent of, like, a grand jury to see if they can get an indictment. Okay. But the big thing that's holding them up is they can't figure out, A, if this is him, where did he get the explosive material? And B... Okay. How does he know how to make a bomb like this? Because these bombs were very unique, right? Okay. In his time in the military, he there was a rumor that he took an explosives course, but there was no proof of it, right? And okay. where did he get the material? They couldn't ever. And when they searched his property, they never found any indication of it. So where was his bomb making like lair? Right. So where did he build them? Where did he get the expertise? And where did he get the materials? They could never figure that out. So this just kept, it basically just became this cold case that they would try to like investigate, but they never could get anywhere. Right. Okay. So by 2010, 2011, I believe the laws had changed in Australia to where it was easier to charge somebody based on circumstantial evidence. Okay. So a cold case unit had been established and they were looking back through some of these cases. Well, around the same time, the, the reporters that I talked about um, that did the expose and the book, they had yeah. gotten like a tip from somebody about it, like somebody who had been a witness at one point. And they start looking into it. And the the reporter, she didn't actually know the story because a lot of people were afraid to talk at all. Right. Right? Yeah. So she starts looking into it, and eventually they find some pretty interesting information. Number one, they find out that um, the rumor was... At one point, the cops started following Leonard 24-7. Okay. And, but he figured out pretty quick they were following him. Yeah. And he would do shit to fuck with them. He'd drive in circles... He would walk up to their car and offer them coffee, like, just being a dick, of course. But at one point, he yeah. disappeared into some, like, bushland that was, like, bordered his father's home and lost him. 
he knew because that's where he grew up. He knew that land very, very well. So eventually they find out that there was a ca- there was a cave that was nicknamed Jimmy the Black's Cave that apparently a bunch of teenagers had found like weapons and explosives in this cave in on this land that Leonard knew very, very well. Right. Okay. So they had. There was nothing there by the time they, the reporters got like a guide to take them out there, but there was nothing there. But it was pretty well understood. Like, okay, this is probably where he did this. That's number one. Yeah. Then where did he get the explosives? Well, right near his father's home, there are a few mines and quarries. When you're mining and you're doing stuff like that, there are explosives. And guess right. what? And guess what? Around the time of the bombings, there had been robberies at the quarry. And guess what was stolen? The exact same bomb materials that were used. Oh, boy. Now, the third, where did he get this expertise? Like, he didn't get it in the army. He was a cook. He never went to war. Like, he, you know, yeah, he's a fireman, but they don't really teach you how to make bombs. Like, okay, as a fireman, I don't think, anyway. Yeah. I, yeah. I don't know. Maybe how to diffuse them. I don't know if you'd have to learn how to build them. I don't right. know. But then they find out what Leonard Warwick's father does for a living. He was an explosives expert in the mines. Are you fucking kidding me? Nope. <laughs> so this whole time, his, his, the explosives expert is right there? And so how long has it been since this started at this point? That they found like that out? how many out? years since? Well, well, yeah, from when the first bomb went off to when they're just now finding this out. Uh, about. Like 30 years or so or whatever? 27 years about. From 1984 to 2013 or 2012, I believe, is when they found that out. So, yeah. The reporter who wrote the book, she says, I call Ross excited with the new revelations and said, guess what Warwick's old man did for a living? I start. He was a bloody shot firer at the local mine. Okay. A shot firer in the minerals industry assembles, positions, and detonates explosives at mining sites to dislodge rocks or or soil. Still, they still don't know if his father knew right or if he just taught him this stuff about explosives when he was little right more than likely his father did not know i don't think his father knew i think he taught him how to do this shit when he was a little kid yeah like just like a hey let's bond over some you know explosives (laughs) boys bond over guns and blowing shit up i'm sorry right they really do Didn't you say previously that the cops had gone to Leonard's dad's house because that's where they got one of the 22s yeah. for testing? But they never asked him what he did for a living. They didn't know. <laughs> that's why some All people... Right. <laughs> now, the cops throughout this, something else that was kind of interesting going around at the same time was the cops, the the police force were was going through this incredible period of like corruption being exposed so there was a lot one of the the lead detectives was actually suspended during the investigation over an unrelated matter and there was all this shit going on like there was a lot everybody should really read the book it's a fascinating kind of look at the whole story but yeah oh my god so the report airs and the cold case unit they actually go back and they have the blood evidence That they took. From the church? Uh Uh-huh. Nice. And Leonard would not give a blood sample, of course. But now, Trudy was of age. So they tested it against Trudy's blood. And it came back that it had to be one of her parents. Clearly wasn't Andrea. So who could it have been? There was... They found out later that after the... If you remember, he broke into the church twice. right? Right. Once... And then, like, a week later, a second time. The first time, he cut himself and bled all over the place, right? Mm -hmm. Well, come to find out later that right after that date of the first Mm break-in, Leonard was was sporting a giant cut on his face. Really? Uh Uh-huh. Now, he told one – and they had 
witness like testimony in court about this. He told one person that he cut himself shaving and he told another person that he fell off his bike. Oh boy. So like when you're telling conflicting stories, that's, that's one of those things that makes you more suspicious about, okay, what really happened? Right. And for me, I wonder if he showed up the first time with the bomb, but when he cut himself, he thought it would look suspicious. Maybe. So he waited. And that's why he came back like a week later. Like, I don't know. No, but that would but make that sense. Was, like, what if the bomb <laughs> didn't go off? And all of a sudden they see that there's this broken window with this blood everywhere that he can't clean up. Like, right. And then they go talk to him. Like, he's sporting a cut. And enough people from the church have seen him. The church really did become like... The church members that he had been, like, stalking and harassing leading up to the bombing, they really did become the primary witnesses for a lot of this because they had seen him. Like, he went to some of their homes and, like, sat across from them and, like, interrogated them on, like, where's Judy? Where's Andrea? Where's Trudy? Like, where did you take them? What did you do with them? And I was like, dude, Jesus. So, but once again, the cops didn't see him at the time. They Mm -hmm. saw him after the bombing. So they didn't necessarily, I don't know how healed up it was at that point. So they didn't necessarily know that, like, he had this. Interesting. Smart. Now, at this point, this is what's, believe it or not, this to me, this, I might might be a horrible person for saying this because I'm through, through all of these deaths, right? I'm about to say that this is the worst part of the story for me. And it it technically is a part of the story where nobody died. But still, I find this part of the story to just be (laughs) horrifying. Okay. She lived with Leonard from the time she was seven until she was 15. Why until she was 15? Well, Leonard got remarried. And the new wife and Trudy didn't get along. So after doing everything he did to get her, he pretty much sided with his new mail order bride from the Philippines over his own daughter and kicked her out. All that. You did all that. Right. Just to fuck her over for anyways. uh, For a woman. He according to the book, if I'm if I'm remembering this part of the book correctly, he went to the Philippines to actually pick up another girl, but it didn't work out, so he brought this one back instead. It sounds it she's not a mail order bride. I should let in my opinion it sounds like she's a mail order bride. Okay? Right. I don't well, know how else. In those circumstances, that's fair. Like I don't know what to say. So, yeah. Trudy Trudy says in the interview that that was done with her and Andrea, like cuz they didn't talk to the press or anybody either. They were terrified. She said the last time right. she saw her father was at her wedding. I believe she was like 21. She's married. She has her own children now. Um, she, she said it was a very stressful day, like, because her mother and father saw each other and Leonard was, he's just not a pleasant person. He is an awful, awful person right. just to be around. Like people who his co when they talked to his coworkers, his coworkers was, were like, yeah, he's a dick. Like he'll be talking to you. And for some unknown reason, you will offend him. And he will just walk away from the conversation in the middle of talking. Like, He's he's just an asshole. The only things they could tell him about, he doesn't socialize with anybody personally. They said he likes to hunt and he likes pornography. That's all they could tell him about him. Aw, oh, man. I was just like an awful person all around. I was like, there's nothing wrong with porn, but if that's all somebody, your coworkers can tell people right. about you. Then how much porn are you watching at work? Thank you. Thank you very much. <laughs> it's a little weird. Like, okay. That, right, right. You're right, because there's nothing wrong with pornography, but exactly like you said, you got to be watching it at work for people to know that that's what you do all day. Right, but if people at my job were like, yeah, Laura's got two kids and a husband and a dog, and she likes to paint, and she loves threesome pornography. Like, she's really into, like, bukkake films. Like, what the fuck? <laughs> like, right? Oh, and she loves reading. Like, what the fuck? <laughs> Okay. Oh, that's why you like the audiobooks, because you can listen and watch at the same uh, time. <laughs> see, you figured me out. Damn it. I revealed to you my dark <laughs> secret. Jesus Christ. Oh, my God. Oh. So finally, in finally, in 2015, 
they charge him with 32 charges. The trial takes years. He's such a piece of shit. Like, he's flipping off the camera in the middle of court, of course. Yeah. Like, I was looking at some pictures of him while you were telling the story, and every single one, it's like he's pushing up his glasses, but he's doing it with the middle finger and shit. And I'm like, mm hmm. Oh, yeah. He's a man. Dick. He is a dick, dude. The, here, the, the court stuff just keeps going on and on and on. Like, he claims that he doesn't have a lawyer and he can't afford a lawyer. And then his lawyer was bullying him. I'm like, right, because you seem like the type of person who can get bullied. Number one. And number two, right. it's pretty rich hearing about hearing you saying somebody was bullying you. Fuck yeah. off. Right? Whatever. But eventually he is convicted of just about, do you need to go check on him? If you don't care about the noise, I'm good. They're dogs. Okay. They bark. Sorry if y'all hear barking. <laughs> it's it's a, it's our home. It's just, like, yep. don't know what to tell you. Um, eventually he does have the, the trial by a judge. The judge finds him guilty on almost everything. Unfortunately, he didn't find him guilty of the murder of Stephen Blanchard, the, the brother. There just wasn't, yeah. there wasn't enough proof. Yeah there they just yeah and that was really devastating to the family oh well, yeah um, obviously like they finally got him but you know it just yeah it's just sad unfortunately when andrea left the home when she was 15 andrea left home when she was 15 no trudy right? left home the oh, little girl okay trudy okay mm, trudy, i'm sorry i thought you said andrea i might have said andrea i'm sorry so trudy okay, left home so trudy left mm -hmm. but she didn't want to go live with andrea because she's andrea was living with a boyfriend who had unbeknownst to andrea been molesting trudy <sighs> so andrea or trudy was taken in by some family friends um eventually she told her mother her mother reported that piece of shit and he went to prison um good thank god <laughs> Thanks. So sure they can convict him right. of you know, but can't convict somebody else of multiple, I know right <laughs> bombings and murders. Right. So eventually he got he got sentenced to like life in prison. He's now seventy two years old, et cetera, et cetera. Um, but believe it or not, there's one more mystery yet to be solved. Believe it or not. Okay, what is that? The mystery of what happened to Leonard Warwick's little sister. Right after Leonard Warwick's father passed away, he had left everything 50-50 between Elaine and Leonard. Right after that, Elaine has dropped off the face of the planet. Nobody has seen her. Cure, like every piece of identifying information that that you would have that a person has hasn't been used or touched it's like she disappeared off the face of the planet and guess who got all of daddy's money leonard mm -hmm. fucking leonard so they leonard. still don't know what happened to her that's still a big fat old mystery as to what happened and to how elaine long ago was that that was when was that i believe yes eileen muriel Warwick. Eileen Muriel Warwick, yes. Where is she? I don't know. Where's that? Uh... In 1993, the father of Len and Eileen died. In his will, he left his son and daughter assets to be split evenly between them. Eileen hasn't been seen since. So since so 1993. 1993. Yep. God. So if you think about it, like, he... He got away with it for so fucking long. Like, he did the first two with guns. And then there was, like, a four-year period of nothing. And then he, right. one bomb, got away with it. Two bombs, got away with it. Three bombs, got away with it. Four bombs, got away with it. Like, it was just one after another after another. And then he got what he wanted. And everything stopped. I mean, he knew at this point all he had to do was keep his mouth shut. Because they couldn't, right. like, they couldn't do anything. All they had was circumstantial evidence. They didn't know about the cave. They didn't know where he got the explosives. And they didn't know where he got the know-how. So if you have somebody like that who, it's like a child continuing to get away with things. Like, they're just, like, eventually right. he blew up a building with 100 plus people in it. Like, yeah. why? Because he got away with it the first three times or four times. However the yeah. fuck. Like, it's... It really is stunning. And it took forever. He just got sentenced like last September. 
right. of 2020. So he's, so he's life in prison. Does Australia have the death penalty? No, they don't. But they do have life in prison. So he is... He is in prison, and you can tell just – I feel really bad. Allison, who was Justice G's daughter, the justice whose wife had been in the hospital, um, she was 12 at the time of the bombing. Severe PTSD. Like – Well, yeah. Because what they did was – and I understood this, this inclination, but I don't know if it was a good idea. I understand it, but I don't know if it was a good idea. They they bulldozed what was rem- like the rubble of what the house was, and they rebuilt it on the same spot as kind of like an act of defiance. But unfortunately, yeah. she was twelve. It was very much like, but the bomber knows where we live. What if he comes right. back? So it just left her in this constant, constant state of fear, and yeah, it was something that she never really. Like, she was interviewed for the book, and she talks about it. Like, it's something she struggled with her whole life. Like, it left – this man left this trail of just destruction. Like, yeah, that you just can't even imagine. Like, I was stunned I'd never heard of the story. And I don't – and I I have a lot of theories. You know, it was Australia. It was the 80s. We didn't have the internet yet. By the time we did have the internet, a lot of people had forgotten about it, and the people who hadn't wouldn't talk. Like, well, yeah, <laughs> nobody terrified. Was, exactly. Like he just kept getting away with it. Like, and I honestly, Andrea and Trudy, I don't know where they are now, and I don't, I don't really care to know too much. Like, I, they've just obviously been through it. Well, yeah. Good lord, how much can you know two people go through? Like, right. and Trudy says in the interview, she's like. All of these people were murdered over me. Like, to put that on your daughter, knowingly. Like, you knew you were a suspect. You knew, like, everybody thought you were the person who did it. Like, you knowingly put that on your daughter. Like, it's it's guilt of a good person. Like, she didn't do anything wrong. Andrea didn't do anything wrong. Like, yeah. So, I'm going to put some links to some... Uh, domestic abuse, you know, resources and things like that. You can get out if it's you, just if you're listening to this. There are resources out there. Obviously, a lot has changed since the 80s, and this is in Australia. So right, you you can get out. You can reach out for help. But, yeah, that's, that's the yeah. bonkers-ass story that has been, like, consuming my brain as to, like, how, how, right. just how. <laughs> Like, how did this go on for this long? <sighs> well, and, you know, you have to wonder, like, you know, for any of the detectives or investigators that were working on it, like, retrospectively, you know, they're probably like, how did we not, how did we not see that before? Oh, yeah, you they know? were, the, you know, the one cop that was interviewed in that that special, it, it haunted him because Leonard Work was the one that got away. Like, he knew it yeah. was him. And it just... It haunted him. Yeah. But yeah. That's the story. He, uh, He's behind yeah. bars. Right. Path of destruction. Path of All destruction. All right. Well, hopefully, hopefully the uh, toilet paper in prison is worse than the government <laughs> stolen toilet paper. I hope your ass bleeds for the rest of your life, sir. <laughs> right? Or maybe they just don't give him any toilet paper so he endures a life of itchy, burny asshole. There you go. <laughs> <laughs> All right, my dear. Well, that is the end of our episode. We'll be back with our normal just kind of talking about being moms here soon. But I think we'll wrap this up. So until next time, I'm Lara Mack. I'm Jessica James. Love your face. I got it right. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Keep it sane. <laughs> Waffle snatch out. <laughs> that... Needs to be the new everything. Like, waffle snatch out. Okay. <laughs> I'm going to sign my emails. Waffle snatch out. <laughs> there you go. Hey, parent peeps. Make sure to subscribe on iTunes or on your favorite podcasting platform. Stay strong, mommies and daddies. Love your faces.